Hi guys, this video is about breaking C programs into parts because our problems will become more and more complex and in order to manage this complexity we will break our source files that would become too large for uh, being convenient into different translation units. And this will require us to write so-called header files and we also have to think about the build process. To understand what kind of problems we will face once we split source files into different translation units, let's begin with a simple example where still everything is in just one source file, but this source file actually will not compile. The compiler will complain that uh, there is a function call of a function that wasn't previously declared. So you also have to recall what is the meaning of a declaration and what is the meaning of a definition. A declaration is just a bookkeeping information. For function declaration, it means uh, information about how many parameters of what type are expected by a function and does it return a value? And if yes, what uh, is the type of this value? And the definition is some additional information. So it's a declaration plus some information about how to generate code for a function. And in this case, we have three definition of our functions. And this function main contains a statement with a function call, a function call of function foo, which is okay because uh, previously it was already defined and by that also declared. So the compiler knows this function foo doesn't expect any parameters. It doesn't return uh, some value. So the compiler knows how to generate this function call. Now this function foo also calls a function, function bar. And here we actually do have a problem because this definition of function bar and by that also the declaration of function bar wasn't seen by the compiler yet. It comes after this implementation of function foo. So to overcome this problem, you of course just could put this implementation of function bar before the implementation of function foo, then the compiler already has this information. But this uh, solution will not work if function bar also would call function foo. They could call uh, each other. And one way to overcome this in general is just to use a declaration that comes before the function uh, foo. And this means you have here just the bookkeeping information. There will be some function bar available later, uh, a function that doesn't expect any uh, parameters, doesn't return a value. Then the compiler can generate code for this call in uh, function foo of this function bar before this definition was seen. And this solves the problem uh, in general. With this simple rule, you only can call a function if it was previously declared. We now can break this program into parts, for example, three parts for each definition of a function, one translation unit. And then we have one translation unit with the definition of function main. And because we call here this function foo, we need a declaration for that. And the compiler can generate for this some object code. That uh, object code is uh, of course not executable because it's obviously missing the implementation of function foo. So this object code will contain some placeholder for this address of function foo. And later the linker needs to patch this placeholder with the right address of function foo. So a second uh, part then will be of course for function foo, which calls two functions. So it needs declarations for these two functions. Function putas is declared in a standard header and also in this third part, uh, function bar also calls put as, we also need to include the standard header. And then we can use GCC as a wrapper for the compiler and the linker. And with one command, we then can translate each of these source files into an object code, into an object file, and then uh, link together this object uh, files together with some libraries into an executable. And of course, you also know that uh, with some option, you can uh, give this executable a different name from a dot out. Now also recall that GCC is actually more than just a wrapper for the C compiler and the linker. It's also a wrapper for the preprocessor and for the assembler. And when we translate like that source files into an executable, we always trigger a big machinery. And now assume that instead of just three source files, we actually have several hundreds of source files and each of them has several thousands uh, lines of code. Then uh, compilation time really begins to measure. And now assume that you just make one 
modification to one of the source files, uh, to foo.c. And then you don't want to redo everything. You just want to redo what is necessary. And we already had a quiz about that. And you saw that it's uh, sometimes kind of inconvenient to uh, do this manually step by step, but that it is possible that uh, you can figure out that in this case, you just have to regenerate the object file and you have to link again uh, this object files and this library. So of course, uh, this uh, is required uh, to have some feasible compilation times if you have larger projects, but we need some way to uh, keep track of things. Uh, we need a tool which is doing this tedious work for us. So let's write down again these rules. When do we have to regenerate an object file from a source file? Well, only if the source file has changed. Hopefully the compiler will not generate random code from a source file. That means if the source file is the same as before, the object code that you would get if you uh, generate again an object file would not be different from before. So one rule would be if the source file is newer than the object file or an object file does not exist at all because we haven't uh, built any object file so far, then you need to build this object file, but otherwise not. And similar rules would uh, be there for every source file, for example, for bar.c and for main.c. And then we also have a rule uh, for the linker. When do we have to link together these object files together with the standard library so that we get an executable? Well, only if the object files have changed or actually also the uh, standard library. But let's assume that the standard library uh, hasn't changed or doesn't change in our case because we do not do any uh, big compiler updates. Then one rule would be if one of the object files uh, has changed, link together all the object files together with the standard library again, into an executable and otherwise not. These rules about when to rebuild certain things and how to do that, when to rebuild object files or executables can be written down in a programming language, which then can be understood by some tool. And this tool then can do the job for us. And the tool that we will use in this lecture is GNUMAKE. And here you see a program for GNUMAKE with four rules. Each of these rules has uh, the following format in the first line. We have on the left hand side of this column some target and on the right hand side a list of dependencies. The target and these dependencies are just files and um, GNUMAKE will check whether this rule uh, should be triggered and for that it will compare the timestamps. If the timestamp of one of these dependencies is newer than the target, the rule should be triggered and then these commands that follow this first line will be executed. Now, GNUMAKE is actually a powerful programming language. It's a so-called functional programming language. And in this functional programming languages, recursion always is a, a big part of the deal. And you will see uh, how powerful this is if the projects become larger. In the demo, I will just show you that, for example, the order in which you specify these rules um, do actually not really matter. Because GNUMAKE will check if one of these dependencies is in some other rule a target itself. And that means if we, for example, change this order so that in the first rule, we just uh, specify that if one of these object files uh, is newer than the target, um, then uh, link again together this object files into an executable. It will before check if one of these object files needs to be updated. And so uh, GNUMAKE will detect all these dependencies. Still, uh, GNUMAKE also has some annoying feature and one of them I also will show you. And this is that this uh, indent um, that you need for these commands needs to be a tab, at least uh, one tab followed by some other white spaces. In this directory, I already prepared everything, uh, all the source files and the make file. The source files are exactly as you saw it on the slides. So this is main, this is foo, and this is bar. On the left hand side, I also can show you the content of the make file. Here I actually do have this uh, tabs in front of this uh, commands. So this make file will work. Uh, let me show you how you use it. You can specify make together with a target. For example, if I want to check whether foo.o is up to date, which is not the case because it doesn't exist. So I can specify uh, 
the target as an argument and then GNU make will generate this object file for me here. If I would redo this again, so here uh, make saw that the file foo.o already exists. It took the time step of this file, compared it with the time step of the source file foo.c and because foo.o was newer or at least not older than the source file, it uh, figured out that this rule needs not to be triggered. Now with touch you can update the temp timestamp of a file. So now uh, foo.c uh, has the timestamp of now or a few moments ago and it's now newer than uh, foo.o. So if we now apply this rule again, uh, it regenerates the object file. So it's important to know that make is not comparing the content of a file, it's just comparing the timestamps. Now, in order to generate the executable, uh, that's probably what we're most interested in, I have to specify here the target a.out and then make figures out that foo.o doesn't need to be regenerated, but the object files for main and bar needs to be generated. And of course, uh, it has to link together all this uh, object files into an executable. If we now would redo this again, uh, make figures out that everything is up to date. If we now would, for example, uh, touch uh, bar.o, just uh, the object file, then it only links together this new object file into an executable uh, together with the uh, other object files, of course, and we have a new executable, but it would not um, use the compiler for uh, generating a new object file. If we, for example, would delete uh, the executable and uh, run make a.out again, it also just would link together the object file. So it exactly figures out what needs to be done following the rules from before. Now, usually uh, you just want to specify make without any arguments and then uh, you expect that it's uh, checking the rule that you are most interested in, uh, probably the rule for uh, regenerating this executable. But make is by default always using the first rule as its default rule. And you see here, it's just uh, checking whether main.o is up to date. And this is the case, so nothing needs to be done. And that means if I now would delete a.out and run make again without any arguments, it just checks this first rule. This rule doesn't get triggered, so nothing gets done. Now, um, of course, uh, we could uh, go back to using a.out as argument, but usually we want to have this uh, rule for generating an executable as a default rule. So we can do that by making this the first rule. And then you see uh, now it's considering this as the default rule, it's checking whether a.out is up to date. It's not the case. And uh, now it's uh, linking together this object files again and generates this a.out. Now let's do the following. Let's uh, change the timestamp of bar.c. And before I now will hit uh, return, let me again explain how GNUMake actually will check these dependencies. So of course it begins here with the default target. Uh, it checks whether this default target needs to be updated. This is the case if one of these dependencies, that means uh, one of these object files is newer than uh, a.out. But before this actually gets checked, it first uh, checks if one of these dependencies is also a target in some other rule. And in this case, actually every dependency is a target uh, in some other rule. So it will check uh, the rule for um, updating main.o and because main.c is not the target in some other rule, uh, here we actually just compare the timestamps of main.c and main.o. And similar here, we just compare the timestamps on also just here. Now in this last rule, we actually have a rule that gets triggered. So this will regenerate an object file for bar. And that means if afterwards this uh, rule actually gets uh, checked by comparing timestamps, the timestamp of bar.o is newer than the timestamp of a.out. So that means here we will now first regenerate the object file bar.o and then link together this object files. 
So about this uh, not so um, nice feature of uh, GNU make, which uh, can cost you hours. Uh, in some editors, uh, you don't have this syntax highlighting by default for make files. And if you then use an indent uh, with spaces, you don't see a difference. And this is really annoying because, I mean, nowadays you get some kind of nice error message, which tells you that uh, you should use a tab instead of eight spaces. But uh, actually, what, let's see what happens if you use an indent uh, with fewer spaces. Uh, missing separator, and this is not so uh, nice to understand if you never used uh, GNU make before. So check out your editor. First of all, that you have syntax highlighting for make files, and also in most editors, you have um, some way to see this invisible characters. In Vim, you can use set list jars, and then you can specify, for example, that a tab can be indicated with uh, some arrows um, by that. And after that, you use set list. And then you see here uh, with this indication, this is an invisible uh, tab. Now it's visible. If you want to undo this, uh, do it with set no list. And with that, you can uh, fix problems like that. So really uh, kind of annoying, but uh, we have to live with that. Of course, this was a very simple make file. If you just have three source files, then you uh, certainly can write down explicitly all the rules. If you have a project with a few hundred of source files, you need a more convenient way. But before we deal with certain features of GNU make, how to make this more um, pleasant to uh, write uh, make files for larger projects, we should uh, consider in simple examples what uh, further challenges we will face when we split a large program into translation units. This translation units in general will also include certain header files. And with this header files, we have uh, more dependencies. If a header file changes, then every source file that includes this header file also should be updated. And this also needs to be automized. And of course, there are also features how to incorporate this into the make files. Uh, but let's first consider this problem in general. Uh, why do we need header files and how do we provide them? Once we have broken our big, huge program into smaller, more manageable parts, we will improve these parts. And that means things will change. And this sometimes comes with a certain responsibility. If we, for example, change the implementation of a function so that it now gets some additional parameters, then uh, we have to update the declarations in other translation units for this function. Otherwise, we run into a problem because the compiler just looks at one translation unit at a time and compares the function calls to the declaration of this function. And if this is uh, correct, how we call this function, it will generate some object file for this uh, translation unit. And afterwards, the linker just sees this object files. And from this object files, it actually would just um, have little information about the meaning of certain symbols. So in this case, you do not get any protection from the tools. And in this example, we just would get some undefined behavior. In some other cases, we just get a crash when we run the program. So in this state, everything will work. The declarations match the definitions. So it prints foobar. Now let's change the implementation of function bar so that it has an a parameter of type integer and in the implementation of the function we now use a printf statement printing the value of a if the caller knows uh, that some parameter actually should be passed and in this case we just get some undefined behavior of the program it just prints uh, some value uh, nobody specified it and now um, you already saw this in some previous video. We changed this uh, to a definition of a variable bar with value 42. And this will cause a crash. But again, when we were using these tools, the compiler and the linker for generating the executables, uh, 
we did not see a warning or an error message. And in this case, we also cannot expect a warning or an error message. We have to do something to get a warning or an error if we do things wrong. And this is why we need this header files. The rules for dealing with header files are kind of simple, but uh, you have to follow a few strict rules. And the first rule is if you have a source file that implements a function that might be used by other translation units, then you also have to provide a header file with some kind of a promise that a certain function in a certain form will be available. So this header file will, of course, contain the declaration uh, of each function that you uh, want to make available to others. And these declarations are within this include cards. So the next rule will be that you have to include this header file also by yourself. This is important because if you forget to update the header file uh, after changing the implementation, this will give you an error from the compiler because the compiler will see what you include. That means the compiler will see this old outdated declaration and then a definition which is inconsistent to it. And then you get an error message. And recall that error messages are in this case what we want. Now, if a other translation unit uses such a function, it always should include the header file and not use some handwritten declaration within the translation unit itself. So that means in foo.c, we now include this header file. And because foo.c also provides a function that uh, others might use, for example, in main.c, we also have here a header file, of course, also with uh, an include card. And in main.c, we just include this. Now I will show you how this will actually detect all these problems that uh, implementation becomes inconsistent with what we promise in the header file and how improper calls of functions will be detected. So here I did split the terminal as many times as needed so that we can see all the files that we have created. Uh, here we have the make file, which actually will not work currently, so I will not uh, use it for a moment. Here we have the header for foo.c, here we have foo.c itself, here we have the header for bar.c, here bar.c itself, and here main.c. And because this make file will not work currently, let's um, compile this manually, what we actually want to avoid. And then you see currently everything works fine because all the function declarations are consistent with the function definitions and the function calls are correct. Now let's change that. Let's uh, make this implementation of bar inconsistent with its declaration because it now expects actually some parameter which is not used in the implementation but still the compiler will first see that here function bar was declared as a function that does not expect any parameters in the implementation it does expect some declaration and this should be now detected as an error and here we go we get an error in bar.c line 5 that's where we did this inconsistent uh, extension and of course, we now could uh, update the declaration, uh, what we obviously forgot, that now this function expects some parameter. And now we should get an error from foo.c because we now call this um, function bar incorrect without a parameter. And here we go, we now get an error. And then we could uh, update it that it gets some parameter and then this error would be gone. Okay, and of course this has no effect uh, on what the program is doing because we are not using this parameter. Now, what is the problem with make? Currently, I do not have any object files. I deleted them when I rearranged here the terminals. This is why it seems that make actually does work. If I now uh, run make, it sees that all the object files need to be updated or generated at all. And that means that also this executable a.out gets linked. Now, why does it just seem that things work? Let's uh, change here the declaration of um, bar so that it now is an integer, a global variable called bar. And I will not update the implementation in bar.c. But I will 
use correctly this global variable declared uh, in bow.h and will overwrite it with 42. And of course, this should cause a serious problem. And we hope that when we compile uh, things, we get an error message. But this is not the case. So again, we have an executable without a warning or error first. And if we run it, we have a crash. So what went wrong? I mean, did make uh, do a bad job? No, actually not. Uh, make was just doing what we told make. We only could have detected this error if GCC would have tried to compile again bar.c into an object file. And we only have this rule here for updating the object file. If bar.c has changed, then generate again an object file. Bar.c did not change, so that's why make did not uh, regenerate this object file. So we have to update all these rules. For example, we have to specify that this object file also needs to be regenerated if the header file has changed. And similarly, we have to change all these other rules for regenerating the object files. But before I do that, I want to go back to a state where everything is up to date. And then I want to change again bar.h and foo.c exactly as before. And to undo all these changes, I will use here also a new target, a clean target, which is just deleting all the object files and the executable. And the command is simply removing these files. And I use this option dash f so that I do not get an error if these files were already deleted before. So I want to delete a dot out and everything that uh, ends on dot o. And with that, I can now call here make clean. And now you see I'm back to this uh, original state. And now I change back uh, here uh, things to a function call of bar and also here this again uh, is a function that expects one parameter so now everything should work again and the executable also does not crash and now i update this uh, rules as i noted before uh, also update if the header file bar.h has changed here also update if foo.h or bar.h um, was updated or modified. And here we also have to add foo.h. Every file that gets included is now also uh, part of the dependency list. And now we run make again. After I do this uh, modifications again, so here I'm using bar as a global variable. And here I declare it as such a thing and now make works again as it should by uh, providing us an error message because it now triggers um, gcc to recompile bar.c of course this is kind of annoying that we now have to update all the rules and for updating these rules we have to uh, think about what headers are included and uh, this might change over time i mean we do modifications to the implementations and this sometimes requires that we also include uh, additional header files or uh, remove certain um, uh, included header files. And then keeping this makefile up to date is uh, really hard. And we will see there is a simple way to actually you know, make this uh, work and uh, happen kind of automatically. You can use, for example, GCC and also Clang with some options uh, so that it generates you a so-called dependency list. And the options are kind of tricky, but um, here, for example, I wanna have all the dependencies if I generate main.o and um, I wanna write this dependency list into a file, main.d, d for dependency, and I want uh, just generate an object file. That's why I also use here this dash C and I want to compile main.c. And this has generated this file. And you see, this is basically the rule uh, under which conditions this uh, object file needs to be updated. 
And um, in a similar way, we can generate the dependency if we compile bar, then we want to store this in bar.d uh, and the name of the target should be bar.o. And here, of course, we also get the error because I haven't fixed this. Let's do that. Actually, I need an integer if I change it back to a void function bar that expects some parameter. And now this should work. And the same I also do for foo.c. The dependency file will be called foo.d and the target name is foo.o. And that means I now have this three files, main.d, foo.d, and bar.d. And now I will make a few modifications to this make file. Basically, I just rewrite things. I no longer um, add this dependency for this header files up here. I will add this later to the file. Uh, after all this rules that I later will still uh, partially write by myself. And at the end, I will basically insert what GCC um, provided me because GCC is good in understanding what gets included in a certain source file. So I will include, for example, the content of this file main.d, the content of this file bar.d, and the content of this file foo.d. Now GNUMake will combine all these dependencies of a target and duplicates will be ignored. That means foo.o depends on these three files because this dependency of uh, foo.c is already in this list. Also, the order in which you specify these dependencies does not matter. Uh, GNUMake will first read this dependency list or from this rule, the dependency list uh, for foo.o, then later this here combines this. The action rule, the command that gets triggered if a rule um, needs to be uh, applied, will be taken from up here. And now the advantage uh, will be that instead of manually including this output generated by GCC before, I directly will include these files. For that, I use this um, include directive dash include. Uh, dash means the include directive gets ignored if the following file does not exist, which will be the case if we um, generate the object file the first time, then we will not have this file. And in the same way, I will include this uh, file foo.d and bar.d. And these files will be regenerated whenever I regenerate the object file. And for that, I just um, specify here this additional options to GCC, this option dash mt for target, and the target is main.o, this option dash mmd, and this option dash mf for file main.d. And here I actually run out of space. Okay. And I just copy this and change um, the names of the files. Okay, that means now if I run again make, now let's recompile make again to see that now everything is up to date and now we uh, somehow have to check that this dependencies will be updated if a new include directive gets added uh, somewhere or removed somewhere. Um, let's first check the current state. If we touch bar.h, then we have to recompile bar.c and foo.c and this is what happens currently. 
Now, if I would add some include directive to main.c, for example, um, actually just one, for example, bar.h, uh, run make again, then of course, main.c will be recompiled because I modified the file. And afterwards, we have a new dependency. Yeah, so you can see this in main.d. We now also have this bar.h in this list and this list gets included in the make file. That means if I now later touch bar.h and run make again, this um, dependency is incorporated into the make file. So for three source files, we now have a almost uh, perfect build system. If we add some include directive uh, somewhere, this dependency automatically will be incorporated into this make file. And also if we remove some uh, include directive, th this gets updated because this .d files, this dependency files will be updated. However, it's kind of inconvenient that for every source file, we have to write here an additional rule. But on the other hand, you also see that these rules always look very similar to each other. Basically, the only difference is the base name. Uh, here the base name is main in this rule. Here the base name is foo. Here the base name is bar. And we just have to basically use something like placeholders. Now make uh, provides lots of features and a um, few of these features really require that you uh, read certain uh, man pages or the information that I provide on the website. I just show you how to simplify these things. For example, this rules for generating an object file from a C source file can be simplified or uh, written in one rule as follows. You use a placeholder percent in the rule for the base name. And then in this uh, commands, you can use uh, so-called automatic variables. For example, dollar uh, add for the target name. This will be uh, whatever is here on the left on the co um, column. Then uh, this here, um, for example, should be the source name dot d. This is actually simpler than uh, replacing uh, this dot c with dot d. So let's do it like that. And then this dollar uh, less sign will be the name of the uh, dependency file if we just have one. And this will also be used here. And now this rule basically replaces all these other two rules. It's a general rule uh, for that. So let's try that again. Make clean and make. And so now it's already a bit more simplified. What still is annoying that I have to write here a list of all the object files. This is basically the same problem as before. If I add new source files, this list just becomes longer and longer. And here I want to write something like, for example, uh, dollar object files or just object for short. Then I, of course, also do not want to list here all the object files. And here I again have to use an automatic variable. And in this case, uh, the variable is this dollar and this head symbol. And what is also annoying is here this asterisk um, dot o. Here I also can use this variable uh, for objects. And I also do not want to list all the dependency files. I also want to have a variable for that uh, so that I can use it like that. So this way it would be much shorter. Of course, it requires some uh, knowledge about uh, how these details uh, work, but uh, I just want to show you how it might look in the end. Um, for having this variable object and depths, I uh, also need uh, certain features like uh, text functions and uh, this wildcard function. So in this variable source, I want to have a list of all the um, C source files, all files that have the suffix .c. And from that, I will generate this object list by using this uh, pattern substitution text function, pet subst. And it will replace a um, certain pattern, uh, a pattern that ends on .c with this uh, uh, placeholder symbol uh, .o. And 
it should replace everything from this uh, list of source files. So like that. And in a similar way, I will generate this depth. And here I actually will just add dot D like that. And this should do the job again. Okay, and even that can be improved because now we just have one target, a dot out, and we have to know that, for example, um, main is actually a function that can be linked. And if we have more than one uh, test function, more than one main program, uh, this needs to be improved. But just to give you an idea how you can, in general, describe a build system and automize certain things, and that this is actually required if you deal with uh, large projects where uh, you have these dependencies and where you have to keep track of how these dependencies actually change over time. So that's it for this video. On the website, you will find additional information and exercises about what was covered in this video. And in upcoming sessions, we will again deal with this topic. What kind of other language features from C are needed to uh, deal with uh, projects where you have more than just font translation unit and what other tools are useful. Also useful if you collaborate with others in larger projects.